so the wheat was engineered to be shorter. And what were the advantages of having these little short wheats? If you put much fertilizer and water on a tall plant like this, you'll get a result. This is what we call lodging, where the wheat falls down on the ground, and then it uh, doesn't really matter what you do with it, you're not gonna get any yield out of that plant. So the, in, in simple terms then, this wheat is just too tall, it just falls over. Right. And what was the effect of this when it was released into India after it was engineered here? That year was the first year that India actually could export wheat. In the 20th century, the same changes have been taking place in developing countries as took place in Europe and North America before that. Medical advances and improved infrastructure, at least in urban areas, have led to a decline in infant mortality and therefore a growing population. But these people had to be fed, and many experts believe that without the work of Dr. Borlaug and others, poor countries like India would have faced disaster. I spoke to agricultural scientist Dr. M. S. Swaminathan, who was the first person to win the World Food Prize for his part in the Green Revolution. So what would have happened in India without your work establishing these new genetic varieties? If uh, new genetic varieties had not been available from the mid-60s, uh, India would have had series of famines of a disastrous nature. And between 1870 and 1900, 30 million people died out of starvation. That was traditional farming, traditional methods. The traditional ways of farming were associated with recurrent famines. We would have simply had massive starvation and famine if we didn't have this Green Revolution. We would have probably would have farmed every square inch of land and still not uh, be able to produce the kind of food that we are uh, doing today. And so the Green Revolution uh, was one of the, the most significant scientific accomplishments uh, of India and many countries in the past century. But there are those in the West who disapprove of the Green Revolution and the transfer of modern agricultural techniques to the third world. Instead of developing countries adopting the scientific practices of the West, they argue that the West should be adopting the simpler, more primitive methods of agriculture common in countries like India. I am terribly concerned as a, as a consumer, as a mother, a, as a business person, as a citizen of this planet, that we are, we, meaning the Western world, are imposing our big business, big farming skills on cultures that have already been harmed, that are dying out. It's a detriment to our future world. I can understand how people can be mesmerized by the culture of places like India. But what is life really like for people who practice subsistence agriculture? I decided to travel to India to find out for myself. It's not hard to find subsistence farming here, as I discovered when I took a short drive out of the capital, Delhi. I was going to a village to meet local journalist Barun Mitra and to see what rural life was like at first hand. And how are you? What's going on? Yep. Good to Great meet you. This village is typical of many villages in India and indeed the rest of the third world. Homes have no running water or electricity and everyone works on the land. I wanted to ask Barun if modern agricultural technology was appropriate in such a village. There's people who say that the Green Revolution was actually harmful to India. I mean, look at it this way. In the last 50 years, India's population has tripled. India's food production has quadrupled. Without the Green Revolution, we would have been back in the days when millions in this country starved to death. You know the last famine India has had? When the last that? major famine? When was that? Was in 1943 when about three million people in my state of Bengal and which is currently Bangladesh died. Three million people died of famine in 1943 in this country. We haven't had a famine of this kind since. This year they talked of a drought. The f media went round the country trying to figure out who died. 
they virtually found none. India has made enormous agricultural progress. The point is we have not progressed fast enough, far enough. But primitive agriculture doesn't just lead to a lack of food and poor diets. It also means that countries which are overwhelmingly agrarian cannot afford the modern amenities which we take for granted. What are these things over here? These are dung cakes, is uh -huh. the principal form of fuel, because there's no electricity, and wood is in short oh, they're supply. They're burning this. They're burning this. So you see here, this oh. is a typical kitchen, and you see the dung's burning. And, and they live in this, this is in their huts, this smoke? Yeah, this smoke normally stays within the hut for a long time, because and these, these children aren't breathing this smoke all, all the time. All the time, yes. Eighty percent of the people in India are forced to burn wood or dry dung to cook their food and heat their homes because they have no electricity. And the air pollution from this is deadly. According to the World Health Organization, half a million children die in India every year from respiratory diseases brought about by indoor smoke and rural smog. This form of third world pollution alone is far more damaging than all the environmental problems of the industrial West combined. And it's not just air quality. Villages like this cannot afford the modern water cleaning facilities which we have in the West. And the resulting waterborne diseases can be deadly. Every year, three million people die from diarrhea alone. Consequently, infant mortality rates are still high in villages like this. And even if you manage to survive into adulthood, life expectancy is only 45 years. So there's nothing romantic here about staying on the land with these people? No, it's not romantic for the people who are staying here. It's romantic for the people in Los Angeles or wherever they are to look at these people, look at them as a kind of a living museum which they can come and enjoy and go back to their, to their five-star lifestyle. But for the people here, given a choice, they would jump ship at the first opportunity. Most of us who do not live in this condition fail to realize that agriculture is not their lifestyle, you know, it is their occupation. It's an economic activity. Most of us seem to romanticize their agriculture as their lifestyle. It's not for them, if you ask them. Which means that if these people can improve their agricultural productivity. They would have a better income, which would improve their quality of life, quality of housing, quality of everything. If technology can bring benefits, I think it will be criminal on our part to deny them the option to utilize and gain maximum advantage that a new technology can provide. Uh... It was clear from my visit to India that despite the best efforts of scientists like Dr. Borlaug and Dr. Swami Nathan, there was still much to be done in improving the agriculture and the lives of people here. Despite the Green Revolution, we still have about 200 million people who go to bed hungry every day just in India alone, and that number is probably going to, to keep increasing. The Green Revolution was a spectacular scientific success. It literally saved the lives of millions of people. However, the breeding technology used for the Green Revolution is limited and can only go so far. In order to feed India's growing population, a second revolution is needed. And for this, people are looking to genetic engineering. 